Colonel Sweet, greetings. Great to see you in First Western. Thank you for being in our program. All right, well, thank you for bringing me on the show. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, what's going on in Ukraine. I would like to start with the ongoing war in Israel. Hamas has conducted massive attacks against Israel. How did we get here and how could it impact also the war in Ukraine? Well, how do we get here? That's, uh, that's decades and possibly centuries in the making uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. But um, no, we, we got here, I guess, uh, primarily uh, over the, uh, obviously, the, the friction that exists between uh, the, the two entities. And it's been building up. And it's, it's, it's a flashpoint. And it's always been a flashpoint within the Middle East. Uh, Hamas uh, has been uh, supported by Iran for a number of years, particularly with weapons. Um, and it finally came to the point where uh, Hamas saw a window of opportunity and they took it. Uh, now, how's that going to affect uh, operations in Ukraine? It's, um, that's a good question. Uh, the, the first and probably the most, uh, the most dangerous course of action is, is that it's going to divert U.S. attention away from one problem set uh, in Ukraine and shift it to, uh, to another problem set in the Middle East. Now, I don't believe that the United States has to completely shift. The United States can do both. Uh, but it certainly right now has the attention of the United States. And, and most importantly, as you saw last week, as Congress passed a continuing resolution, which included no additional funding to Ukraine, uh, it, it certainly plays into everyone's minds on, uh, on what the U.S. Uh, future course of action is. And I think the Biden administration really needs to get out front and explain to both Ukraine and Israel uh, how they intend to, to work with both parties. Also, Israeli intelligence didn't know this attack coming. Experts say that it is the biggest failure of Israeli intelligence since 1973. In your opinion, why didn't Israeli intelligence know about this attack? Well, it certainly can be considered an intelligence failure, and it is. Uh, they missed indicators. They missed uh, those things that would suggest that, uh, that an attack would be imminent. Look, the, uh, the Israelis are very thorough in their intelligence collection. They rely a lot on human intelligence, having sources within a Hamas network. But they also rely upon signals intelligence, also in other forms of intelligence. I think um, at least one perspective is the, uh, the planning and the coordination for the event may not have been done uh, within uh, Israel or within the Gaza that was done externally uh, to prevent leakage of the information concerning the attack. But the other thing is, where were Israeli intelligence assets focused? There's been some discussion that they were overly focused uh, towards the West Bank and the Lebanon, and that they had assumed away a risk from Hamas uh, in the Gaza area. So it really comes down to where were, where were they focused? Why did they miss the indicators that presented themselves? And then what type of support did they get from a uh, state sponsor, whether it be Iran or whether it be from Russia, possibly? If we compare Israeli capabilities and Hamas military uh, capabilities, in your opinion, what side uh, does have a military superiority and more military advantage on the ground? Well, in terms of numbers and in terms of equipment, um, definitely Israel has the advantage. Uh, in terms of battle space, uh, the, the uh, Hamas certainly has somewhat of an advantage. Uh, close quarters fighting, as the Israelis learned in 2006 in Lebanon, is, uh, is very difficult, very time consuming, and you amass numerous casualties. Um, but the, it comes down also to this war of attrition. When I say attrition, I don't necessarily mean in terms of soldiers, but I do mean in terms of the ability to defend themselves with the Iron Dome and the missiles that are involved with that in order to shoot down missiles that are coming in. Uh, I believe uh, that, that the I heard was 3,000 missiles were into Israel, but clearly available. Um, it just comes down to how long can Israel sustain a counter, um, a counter battery fire against these type of missiles. But in your opinion, how long could Hamas sustain such massive airstrikes by Israeli army? It seems like uh, someone, some parties uh, supplying uh, Hamas with uh, missile strikes, with uh, uh, artillery, artillery shells and with long-range missiles. 
Sure. No, they they have been building up their stockpiles since the last ceasefire. Uh, and, and that's typically what you know, Hamas and Hezbollah do is they, they conduct operations. Uh, they go into a ceasefire, they build up supplies and they conduct operations again. How long can they sustain this type of operation? Uh, I would say probably for weeks or months. Um, but the, uh, the Israeli government has been pretty adamant this time. Is they're not, they're not, they're not fighting for a ceasefire. They're not fighting for a negotiation. They've declared war on Hamas, and I think at this time at, at the tables are going to be just a little bit different at the end state. Uh, I think the complete annihilation of the of uh, Hamas is is right now the end state. At least that's been articulated by several Israeli uh, officials. Also, Israel has been conducting massive airstrikes on Gaza. In your opinion, how could it shape uh, the situation on the ground in the Israel? Well, the, uh, the, the airstrikes right now are their, um, are their primary course of action, very surgical in nature. Uh, you have to understand, I believe, that the Israeli intelligence has, has developed uh, these targets over time, and uh, they are now going after those targets. Um, of course, the second and third order effects are... Uh, or the way it's perceived uh, internationally, particularly as uh, as, as propagandists take advantage of um, of these strikes and report on the number of civilian casualties that occur, and try to paint Israel as the aggressor as opposed to uh, the victim in this uh, in this situation. In your opinion, what should we expect from the war in Israel in the upcoming weeks or even months? Yeah, it, this is going to be a prolonged fight. Uh, I think um, Israeli government has already announced that they're going to a siege, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, Gaza. Uh, they're going to you know, turn off the electricity and the water, and they're going to continue to do surgical strikes. Again, their goal is to remove Hamas. Um, so it's going, to be, it's going to be a long fight, and, and eventually they will have to commit troops into the area, but they're going to set conditions first. Uh, to afford their ground troops uh, the best advantage they have as they go into a close sort of fight in an urban environment. In your opinion, how long would it take for Israel to fully eliminate uh, Hamas terrorists on the ground and in Gaza? Fully eliminate, I, I, I'm not confident that that would ever occur, but to be able to secure uh, Gaza, uh, that, that could take I mean, months, months up to to, to a year. That, that's a, that's a, that's an incredible task, uh, and it's also a task that is uh, troop intensive. So while they are focused on on Gaza and removing Hamas, they also have to be aware of the situation in the north with Hezbollah and then also with uh, with the Syrians. So there's the close fight, and then they have to pay attention to other aggressors in the region that could uh, come to support. Um, Hamas. Uh, could uh, both parties seek a ceasefire or any kind of peaceful agreements in the upcoming uh, weeks or months, in your opinion? Hamas will attempt to negotiate a ceasefire. I'm confident, based upon all of the discussions I've heard uh, on social media and also the news networks, that uh, Israel has no intention of entering any type of peace negotiations or ceasefire, uh, their intention is to attack Hamas and, and uh, remove them. The Wall Street Journal reported that Iran had helped Hamas to organize its attacks against Israel. In your opinion, could also Russia be behind uh, these attacks on Israel? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm confident that they, uh, Hamas had support. Uh, the level of activity that occurred between denial of activity type of operations in the cyber realm to um, drone activity to rockets being fired, ground forces assaulting, paragliders, watercraft being involved, orchestrating and managing all of that is, uh, is a very uh, difficult task, even for the most experienced uh, military forces. And, and obviously Hamas is a, a terrorist organization. So yes, I, I do believe that they had support from Iran. I do believe that support came from the Iranian Republican Guards Accord, IRGC. Uh, there were reports, at least, uh, and, and indications of travel between the Minister of Defense from Russia to Tehran, but also the leader of uh, Hamas had traveled uh, to Russia. So Obviously, that, that provides a visual, at least, of 
coordination between the countries and the organization. Uh, and I wouldn't put it past uh, Russia, especially with their use of disinformation and, and command, if you will, propaganda and the utilization of social media uh, in order to provide some sort of support in the cyber domain. Although Hamas, um, Iran, uh, support Hamas um, military efforts, terroristic attacks, Iran also supplies Russia with deadly drones, which are um, which are attacking our cities and killing our civilians. Uh, don't you think that it's a uh, high time to solve the uh, the issue of uh, Iranian regime? Oh, we're beyond <laughs> solving that 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 issue, I believe. Uh, and, and I don't think many people w would argue that point either. Look, um, Russia leans on Iran as one of its arsenals of evil. And why I say that, I mean, in exchange for um, nuclear capacity or technology, uh, Russia has been receiving these drones that are being used in, uh, in Ukraine. But also uh, some of these drones were used in, uh, in, in Israel this week. Uh, so the exchange of technology is there. Um, the defeat of Russia, at least in my opinion, a defeat of Russia could lead to a regime change. Uh, any type of regime change or a, or a downward fall of Russia would it affect Russia's ability to influence operations throughout the world. Uh, and, and one of those influences would be within the Middle East, particularly Syria, but also within Iran. So the, uh, the second and third order effects of the defeat of Russia in Ukraine can only be positive, particularly for the uh, the Middle East. Also, former National Security Advisor to the U.S. President uh, John Bolton says that it's a uh, high time to uh, change regime in Iran. Uh, would you support such an idea? And is it a realistic uh, possibility? Uh, so the United States isn't in the business of regime change, but the United States is in the business of setting conditions uh, that allow the people within the countries to have free will and self-determination. Um, yes, obviously the removal of the mullahs in the regime uh, within Iran would be beneficial to peace throughout the Middle East, but also peace uh, in, uh, in East Africa um, and in other areas uh, where the Iranian influence has, has spread uh, amongst you know, the Houthi. Uh, they are a... Um, they are a negative force, uh, particularly um, within the Middle East, uh, the Shia particularly, uh, and, and, and the, the linkages that they have to terrorism, particularly the funding part and the, and the equipping part. So it would be a, uh, it would be a much needed uh, reprise if, if Iran could be neutralized, the leadership that is. BBC reports that the U.S. Army is deploying its warships, aircraft carriers and uh, combat aircraft closer to the Israel. Uh, what a kind of message is it? It's a show of force. And it is not necessarily a show of force to, to Hamas, but rather a show of force to Syria, uh, to Lebanon, uh, to Russia and to Iran in that uh, the, the the incident or the the attack is, is is not going to expand, and that we stand with Israel and that we will support Israel if uh, those belligerent countries were to attempt to take advantage of the situation. Uh, if there is a new party of the war in uh, in Israel, could uh, the U.S. troops uh, put their boots on the ground and participate in combat operations? Uh, it. Look, anything is possible, um, but I don't speak for the um, for the president, nor do I speak for the commander of the United States Army, Europe, and, and European Command. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are plans in place to support Israel uh, from multiple uh, domains, uh, and we'll just uh, we'll we'll let those leaders make those determinations. Also, the Institute of Study of War reports that Kremlin is already exploiting the situation in Israel to reduce attention to the war in Ukraine and reduce support for Ukraine. In your opinion, could the war in Israel reduce uh, attention for the war in Ukraine? It's not that it could, it, it already is. There's been a tremendous shift from media coverage from Ukraine to, to Israel. 
And again, with the uh, continued resolution uh, passed in, in the United States uh, last week, reducing Ukrainian aid, that too is, is having an impact. Uh, Europeans, though, are, will step up. I'm confident that they will step up to continue their support at the levels at which they were supporting. Look, the, the United States is a big country. The United States can support both efforts. Um, but that has to be explained um, to both uh, Ukraine and Israel how that's going to happen. It also needs to be explained to the American people so they can get behind it. Also, I would like to cover with you current situation in the war in Ukraine. How could you assess current situation on the front lines and also uh, in the Black Sea? Right. In the front lines, it's, it's uh, the progress that's being made, particularly in the south and the Zaporia region, is, uh, is slow, but it's steady. Um, and they're pushing uh, the Russian forces further south and uh, out of the region. In, in, in the Bakhmut area, there are advances that are being, being made, but Bakhmut, for the most part, from my opinion, is more of a fixing uh, action to hold Russian forces in those areas so that they cannot reposition themselves to the south. Um, it's a multi-domain operation in which um, you're fighting a close fight in the trenches with direct fire weapons, artillery, and tanks. You're fighting a deep fight through attrition with high Mars, storm shadows, and you're going after deeper targets, uh, troops uh, that are staging to come into the battle, ammunition facilities, supply depots, uh, much deeper targets uh, into Russia, striking those areas that, are, that allow Russia to wage war, airfields, uh, areas in which ammunition is being produced. Uh, you have a cyber type of domain. You have anti-Putin forces that are consistently going in and out of Russia on raids. You have partisans in the rear area. Uh, you have um, special forces that are conducting operations. So a multi-domain operation, multi-domain battlefield that keeps the Russian forces off balance, which is best because when they're off balance, they can't attack. So far, the only reprisal that the Russians have effectively had is uh, firing additional missiles onto civilian targets, which is why there's been a big push, particularly by the United States and Germany, to provide more air defense weapons. However, air defense weapons don't win wars, and missiles do get through. The best course of action to defeat the air defense system or the, the missile systems that are firing upon Ukraine is to return fire on Pondo's systems and destroy the system. If you destroy the system, the rockets will stop coming at you. Also, recently NBC News reported that Biden administration could provide Ukraine with Atacams long-range missiles. However, um, it was not officially confirmed by the Biden administration. Uh, what do you think about this news on Atacams? So it's, it's not new, it's, it's just the latest. There's been a lot of discussion for the past six months about Atacams. And the, and the subject surfaces and then it quickly goes away. Uh, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of many analysts, is ATACMS is a critical weapon uh, that the Ukrainians could use to expedite the conclusion of this war. But it's not necessarily the weapon system that we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about the capability. In this case, it's precision deep strike capability. And while ATACMS provides that capability, other assets can perform those missions too. So uh, the addition of fighter jets, the additions of a German uh, Taurus cruise missile would help. Um, as General Ben Hodges would say, um, the goal here is to make a Crimea untenable. Um, when those deep strikes make Crimea untenable and set the conditions for an eventual ground assault onto Crimea and the liberation. So no, those, those assets are critical to knock out, um, knock out Russian capabilities to reinforce and to provide indirect fire support to the four line troops. Let's also discuss the U.S. support for Ukraine. In your latest article for The Hill, you said that uh, the war in Ukraine was turned into political football. How did we get here also? Well, the United States, a political, 20 months into, we stated in the, in the article, nearly $46 billion invested in military assistance. Um, from a U.S. perspective, I believe there's what we call a bit of Ukraine fatigue in that uh, Americans tend to want things now. Um, now, 
from a military perspective, we understand um, that it's condition setting is what you do before you commit. Uh, Ukraine has limited resources that have to set the right conditions before they commit their forces. I believe most military analysts would, would agree with that assumption. You also fight with the army you have. And right now, uh, Ukraine doesn't have the ability to establish air superiority, nor do they have the ability um, with the U.S. weapons to affect deeper targets. So, um, yes, there, there is some fatigue, uh, particularly within the, when I say the administration, but within Congress and the House of Representatives and, and, and the Senate. But I believe the majority of American people still support uh, what's going on in Ukraine and uh, they want a conclusion and they understand that the, the only conclusion can be a defeat of Russia. If you don't defeat Russia, this just extends to the next generation and the next generation. Also, the Telegraph reports that President Biden is considering huge one and done air aid package for Ukraine for $100 billion. However, this aid should be granted by the U.S. Congress. In your opinion, is there a realistic possibility for the U.S. Congress to approve this huge aid package for Ukraine? There's always a possibility. Uh, but the question is, is what is going to be provided in a one-and-done package what Ukraine needs to win the war? If you're simply going to give Ukraine more air defense systems, if you're going to give them more assets that enable Ukraine to fight a close fight and defend themselves, then no, because the fight will only be won through offensive action and they need those deeper strike uh, munitions and, and, and weapons and weapon systems. So is it likely that it could go through? Yeah, it could go through, but the argument is going to be, does this win the war or does it merely for, for another four to six months? Thank you, Colonel Sweet, for your time and for support for Ukraine and glory to Ukraine. Hey, Daniel, thank you for bringing me on the show. And again, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share my opinions on what's going on in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you.